Let's turn again to the uh, Acts of the Apostle, but this time to chapter 9. We're going to read the 31 verses of that chapter. Our text is actually taken from the first eight uh, verses of this chapter. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood, uh, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptised. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name? In Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was uh, with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. It came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down.
uh, also to the uh, saints which were at Lydia. Uh, and there he found a certain man named Ananias, or An Ananias, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Ananias, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwelt at Lydda, Lydda and Sauron saw him and turned uh, to the Lord. Uh, I've read actually a little further than I intended, brethren, but we'll leave the, the reading of God's word there uh, at that point. The text this evening is uh, Acts uh, chapter 9 and those first eight uh, verses. Experiences in life uh, can have a profound effect on how we view things it can have a profound effect upon our attitudes and what we consider to be important. For example, if we've experienced poverty, that can often influence our attitude toward money and even to the rendering of assistance to those in need. Sometimes it can make us to be generously disposed to the needs of others, while it can also cause us to become miserly and reluctant to help those in need. If we suffered from some form of prolonged or debilitating illness, that can also shape our views and our attitudes towards those who are presently enduring those same or similar things. And the truth is that that same uh, experience in life holds true also with respect to sin. If in the course of our lives we have fallen into serious sin, then that experience can also influence how we view others who have also fallen into the same or similar sin. At the same time, uh, the knowledge that in Jesus Christ we have been forgiven of our sins can also heighten our appreciation for what Jesus Christ has done for us in and through the Saviour. Often the greater the sin, uh, the greater the appreciation for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We see that in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. His attitudes, uh, his thinking, were undoubtedly shaped by those things that he experienced in life. Paul was a great sinner. But he was also a great sinner who was the beneficiary of great mercy and grace. And the experience of God's mercy and grace left an indelible impression upon Paul's heart and mind, an impression that he retained for the remainder of his life. And that impression influenced uh, the apostle in his perception of self and also his perception of others. That indelible impression made by God's mercy and grace uh, can actually be clearly seen in what Paul writes in his epistles. Uh, we've already seen that somewhat in the uh, series that we've been uh, working through in Galatians. But you can see that not only in Galatians, but you can see that in fact, in every epistle that the uh, Apostle writes, if one had observed Paul in the early years of his adult life, it would have seemed unthinkable that he could ever have embraced Christianity or that he could ever have played the role that God intended him to play in the establishment and the development of the New Testament church. The truth was that Paul despised Christianity. In fact, one could go so far as to say that Paul hated Christianity. But that hatred evaporated the day that Paul was arrested by the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. By the grace of God and through the life-changing work of the Spirit of the risen Christ, Paul came to love Jesus Christ and from that uh, time on uh, 
willingly sacrificed his life in the service of Jesus Christ. He became, as we read in Acts 22, the apostle to the Gentile world. And through him, the gospel, the very gospel that he despised, uh, he proclaimed uh, to that Gentile world. The conversion of Saul is what we're going to focus upon uh, this evening. Saul's conversion occupies a prominent place in Scripture and particularly in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Not only is it outlined here in Acts chapter 9, but as we've seen, it's also detailed in Acts 22. But if you were to go on further into Acts 26, you would find further details of the conversion of uh, Paul or Saul, as he was then known. Uh, There are further references also uh, to these events in 1 Corinthians. Uh, There are references to these events also in Galatians and Philippians and 1 Timothy. Our text here in Acts 9 contains Luke's historical account of Saul's conversion. The other references that I've mentioned contain Saul or Paul's own description of what took place at that time. The reason that Saul's conversion occupies such a prominent place in Scripture is perhaps uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was certainly dramatic, and secondly, its effects were far-reaching. And furthermore, his conversion sets before the New Testament church, sets before us the essential character of true conversion. Uh, Saul's conversion, one might say, provides a picture of the conversion of every believer. And this is a picture that should speak to the hearts and the minds of everyone here this evening. So I've titled this word of God, The Conversion of Paul, All of Grace. The conversion of Paul, All of Grace. Look firstly at its circumstances, secondly its nature, and then finally its effect. The conversion of Paul uh, was miraculous, brought about as it was by the appearance of Jesus Christ to Saul, or as he later became known as Paul, but uh, by the appearance of Jesus Christ to Saul on the road to Damascus. The immediate circumstances of Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road uh, make it to be miraculous. But the conversion of Saul was even more amazing when viewed against the background of his vehement and violent opposition to Jesus Christ and to the spread of Christianity. Saul, prior to his conversion despised Christianity, not just a little, but he despised Christianity with a passion. We introduced to his intense hatred of Christianity in verse 1 of our text where we read, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Saul was so bitterly opposed to Christianity that he made it his business to seek to curtail its growing influence. He hated Christianity with a murderous passion. Nothing but the annihilation of Christianity was sufficient for him. Indeed, such was his hatred of Christianity that he actually hunted down Christians like animals. Threatening and slaughter of Christians was the very breath of Saul. The destruction of Christianity was the goal of his life. It's what he lived for. He was like a war horse that sniffed the smell of battle. He thrived upon the persecution of the apostolic church. Indeed, he was responsible for the death of 
of many of the followers of Jesus Christ. We read of that in Acts 26 and verses 9 and 10. There the apostle says himself, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Saul's hatred of Christianity appears to have had its origins in his strict pharisaical upbringing. Saul was born around the year 10 AD in the city of Tarsus. And Tarsus was the capital of Cilicia, a Roman province in the southeast of Asia Minor. Saul's father was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, and his father belonged to the sect of the Pharisees. Though a Jew, his father was also a Roman citizen. Probably around the age of 13, Saul was sent by his father to Jerusalem, where he became a student of the celebrated rabbi Gamaliel. And under the tuition of Gamaliel, Saul was schooled in the Jewish religion. Like his father, uh, Saul aligned himself with the Pharisees and the Pharisees, as you well know, prided themselves in their strict observance of the Mosaic law. And as a result, Saul himself uh, became a religious zealot. It appears from what he subsequently writes uh, to the church at Philippi, writing to the Philippians, he declares in Philippians chapter 3 and the verses 4 through 6, If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Saul's zeal uh, for Judaism and its Old Testament rites and ceremonies bred in him an, an, an increasing antagonism toward Christianity. Uh, to that Christianity, which of course uh, viewed the Old Testament rites and ceremonies as having been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Following the death of Jesus Christ, the anticipation of the Jewish religious leaders had been that the followers of Jesus would disperse and that the threat that Jesus and his followers had posed to their authority and indeed their way of life would have been averted. However, Christianity, rather than being curtailed uh, by the death of Jesus Christ, in fact, flourished, it grew. It went from strength to strength. For a period of some two years following Pentecost, uh, Christian, the numbers of Christians grew uh, sharply in number. Indeed, sometimes they grew uh, with spectacular increase. Uh, you read, for example, in Acts chapter 2 that immediately following the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 uh, were joined uh, to the church. You then uh, flip over to Acts chapter 4 and you find there that a further 5,000 which heard the word, we are told, believed. And so there are many, many that were added uh, to the Christian church following the death of Jesus Christ. With increasing numbers, men began to speak more openly and boldly about their faith in Christ. And those men included men such as Stephen. Uh, Stephen, the, one of the first deacons of the New Testament church. And it's in connection with the death of Stephen uh, 
that we first encounter Saul and his hatred of Christianity in the book of Acts. You recall that Stephen, as a result of suborn testimony, was charged with blasphemy and required to appear before the Jewish Sanhedrin. The accusation against Stephen was that this man seeth us not to be or to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. They said, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, that is the temple, and shall change the customs which Moses uh, delivered us. And such thoughts were anathema uh, to the religious leaders of that day. In his defence, Stephen confessed Jesus Christ to be the Christ, to be the uh, long-awaited Messiah. As a result of that confession, uh, Stephen was sentenced to death by stoning. We read in Acts chapter 7, and verse 58 and following, and they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And notice this, and the witnesses lay down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Following the death of Stephen, Christians in Jerusalem came under sustained persecution. We read in Acts chapter 1, rather Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. At that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. For their own safety, Christians were forced to flee from Jerusalem. They sought refuge in the regions of Judea and Samaria to the north. And Saul played a leading role in the ongoing persecution of the Christians at that time. He persecuted them in Jerusalem, but he also sought to persecute them to those places to which they fled. And we read in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. By his own admission, Saul persecuted the fledgling Christian church. In later years, he would write to the uh, church at Galatia, in Galatians 1 and verse 13, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, and beyond measure means literally according to excess, beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And in similar terms, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, we read that Paul writes to the saints at Corinth, and he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Notwithstanding that many Christians uh, have been driven out of Jerusalem, we notice from our text, particularly verses 1 and 2, that Saul was still not satisfied. It was not enough that they be driven out of Jerusalem. Uh, he intended to pursue them further. And so we read, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Uh, so Saul was not content simply to drive the Christians out of Jerusalem, but he wanted to root out Christianity altogether. And to do that, he was prepared to pursue Christians to every place into which they uh, went and where they sought refuge. Uh, Saul's hatred of Christians actually knew very few bounds. Later, referring to this period in his life, he actually acknowledged in Acts 22 and verse 4 that we read, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering unto prisons, or into prisons, both men and women. And furthermore, in Acts 26 and verse 11, we read that Paul says there, And I punished them oft in every synagogue 
and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad or enraged against them, they persecuted them even unto strange or foreign cities. In pursuit of his goal, uh, as we read here in our text, Saul procured from the high priest in Jerusalem a commission that allowed him to demand the extradition from Damascus of uh, the Christians that had sought refuge there. The high priest as president of the Sanhedrin was the head of the Jewish state uh, so far as its internal affairs were concerned and his decrees supported by the Roman authorities carry weight not only in Palestine but in other jurisdictions under Roman rule uh, of which Damascus uh, was one. It mattered not to Saul whether the Christians were men or women. Saul did not care that families were being torn apart. His desire was that Christians, whether they be men or women, should be incarcerated and in many instances put to death. It's probably true to say that in the formative years of the New Testament church, the New Testament church had no greater enemy than Saul of Tarsus. Why such deep hatred? It appears that that hatred lies in uh, his pharisaical roots. Uh, for Saul, Jesus Christ could not be the promised Messiah. That was out of the question. The inclusive argument in Saul's mind was that Jesus Christ had been crucified. And for Saul, the crucified Messiah was a contradiction in terms. Whether Christ's death by crucifixion was deserved or the result of a miscarriage of justice did not matter uh, to Paul. What mattered to Saul was that Jesus Christ was dead. He had died on the cross of Calvary. And as such, he had died as one accursed of God strung up between uh, earth and heaven. Confronted by those who publicly affirmed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, for Saul, as a Pharisee, his course was clear. The law and the customs, the ancestral traditions and everything that was of value in Judaism uh, was imperiled by the teaching that Jesus was the Christ. For a Pharisee like Saul, Christianity was a cancerous growth that needed to be excised. And Saul engaged vigorously in that work. We read in verses 3 and 4, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Armed with the high priest's commission, Saul had set out for Damascus accompanied by a suitable escort. At about midday, as he was approaching Damascus, a light that outshone the light of the sun flashed about him. Uh, this light was so bright that it caused Saul to fall to the ground. With astonishing suddenness, the persecutor of the New Testament church was himself apprehended apprehended of Jesus Christ. That's how he describes it in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. There on the Damascus road, Saul was apprehended by Jesus Christ. As he lay on the ground, Saul heard a voice speaking to him in his Aramaic native tongue. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The one that spoke to Paul that day uh, was the risen 
and exalted Christ. The Christ, the anointed of God, the promised Messiah, Jesus, Jesus whose redeemed church Saul was seeking to destroy. Those whom Jesus Christ had died for on the cross, Saul was seeking to destroy. Here, the risen Christ, the risen Christ that had previously appeared to Peter and James and the rest of the disciples, here the risen Christ now appears to Saul. In his amazement and confusion, Saul asks, Who art thou, Lord? The word Lord here, as is frequently the case in the New Testament scriptures, means no more than Sir. Who art thou, Sir? And the answer comes, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The very Jesus whom Saul had openly rejected as the Messiah, the one who is the object of his contempt and scorn, now personally appears and speaks to him. The assertion that it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks arises from the goads or prods that we use to prick oxen in order to make them work. Often oxen would kick against the use of the pricks, but in so doing, uh, they did not hurt the pricks or the goads, but they actually often hurt themselves. And in those words, Jesus Christ was telling Saul that all his attempts to destroy Christianity, to destroy the Christian church, would prove to be futile, as futile as the ox that kicked against the pricks of the goad. All his efforts would be in vain. And then we read, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. The men who were with him saw the light, uh, they heard the voice, but they saw no one. For Saul, this was a dramatic, totally unexpected turning point in his life. One might say it was the most significant day in the life of uh, Saul. Because from that day forward, Saul became a new man. His life was completely changed. With no conscious preparation, Saul found himself compelled to acknowledge that Jesus was alive. There on the road to Damascus, Saul was converted. A radical change took place in Saul. From that time on, instead of persecuting the Christian church, he became its greatest advocate and he became a preacher of the gospel. He proclaimed Jesus Christ. He called men and women to faith in Jesus Christ. He said to them, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So there on the Damascus Road, an extraordinary change took place in the heart of this once vehement opponent of the Christian faith. Instead of being a hater of Jesus Christ, Paul or Saul became a lover of Jesus Christ. What brought about such a radical change in Saul? How was this possible? The first thing to note, and perhaps even the most fundamental thing to note, is that this was not the doing of Paul. 
It was not the doing of Saul. Indeed, it was contrary to the will of Saul. Apart from the intervention of the risen Christ, Saul would have entered Damascus and gone on his persecuting ways. He would have dragged men and women out of their homes and he would have bound them and he would have conveyed them ultimately to Jerusalem uh, and perhaps for incarceration and in some instances even uh, for death. In other words, he would have exercised the mandate given to him by the high priest in Jerusalem. It wasn't that Saul uh, had somehow or other uh, there on the Damascus road come to see the error of his ways and that he then made some rational decision to change course and to adopt another approach in his life. They had nothing whatsoever to do with the change that took place in the life and in the heart and the mind of Saul. Now what took place there on the Damascus Road was completely and solely a work of God's grace. God intervened through the risen Christ in the life of Saul. This was not Saul's doing. It was not Saul's desire. But it was the doing of God. It was the doing specifically of Jesus Christ. Saul had no say in the matter whatsoever. And there was no reason, no meritorious reason at least, as to why God should do this. But Paul, Saul was the great persecutor of God's people. And there was nothing meritorious in Saul. It wasn't as though in any way God was indebted to Saul. Nor was it that Saul was seeking or reaching out to Jesus Christ. There's none of that. Indeed, quite the opposite. Saul was a persecutor of the people of God. He stood in opposition to Jesus Christ in the most profound of ways. Notwithstanding, God, through Jesus Christ, in an exercise of his extraordinary mercy and grace, took hold of Saul that day. And Saul confirms that what occurred that day was all of God's grace. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16 that we read this morning. And there we read, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Saul, the great persecutor of God's people, was actually subdued by the risen Christ. You might ask the question, why? Why would uh, God, why would Jesus Christ uh, bestow such a work of grace uh, upon this persecutor of the Christian church? Surely there will be more suitable vehicles uh, that could be used for the promotion and the proclamation of the gospel. Surely this man uh, deserved, in fact, uh, to be cast out and uh, indeed to suffer the eternal punishments of hell for the work or for the uh, approach that he had taken to the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Now, did God do this? Why did Jesus Christ meet 
all that day on the road to Damascus? The answer that's given in our text is because Jesus Christ had work for Saul to do. It shows you that the Lord's ways are not really our ways, are they? We read in verse 6, And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Jesus Christ would use this most unlikely, most undeserving vessel in the service and the establishment of his kingdom. In fact, he would employ Saul in a truly extraordinary way. How was that accomplished? It was accomplished by a radical change in the heart of Saul. It was accomplished by radical surgery. Surgery performed by the Spirit of Christ. Surgery that involved the removal of the hard and bitter heart of Saul. Replaced by a heart that was tender to Jesus Christ and to the gospel. What an extraordinary change. Think about what you read in the epistles of Paul, even as we read this morning in Galatians. Think about the change that actually took place in the thinking and the mindset of Saul following this day on the Damascus Road. From one who hated the cause of Christ, he became one who gave his complete life in the service of Jesus Christ. He literally became a new man. A man that had been spiritually dead was resurrected to spiritual life. And no longer was Saul a man who breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. But he became a man who, trembling and full of astonishment, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? What should be of particular interest, brethren, to us is that the conversion of Saul, though in many senses it's unique, it is not fundamentally different to the conversion of any believer. Every conversion, every drawing of a man or a woman or a boy or a girl to faith in Jesus Christ is a marvellous work of God's grace. Rather than your conversion, my conversion, is an equally marvellous work of God's grace as was the work of God's grace in the Apostle Paul. We might think of ourselves, well, I'm not really like Paul. My life has not been uh, one where I persecuted or have persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, and that may well be true. But that does not mean that we are not great sinners. We are great sinners. And notwithstanding that we are great sinners, we have been called, we've been drawn unto Jesus Christ through the regenerating work of the Spirit of Christ. In that sense, uh, we've been arrested. Uh, we have, in a way, our own Damascus Road uh, where the Lord arrests us and uh, sends forth his Spirit into our hearts and causes us uh, to change our thinking, to change our approach. It's only as we are arrested by the risen Christ that we can ever serve uh, Jesus Christ. We need, as Paul needed, we, needed a new, we need a new heart. We can't do it ourselves. In fact, left to ourselves, we'll never seek, we'll never seek that. We don't want it. And furthermore, we don't deserve it. Like Paul, like Saul, our salvation is all of grace. 
none of self. It's grace from beginning to end. But then do we know of that work of God's grace in our hearts? Do we know of that radical change that comes about through the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ? We need to. We need to if we will ever know uh, life uh, with God and Jesus Christ in eternity. Apart from that work of God's grace, uh, we are outside of the kingdom. We might say to ourselves, well, if, if it's all of grace, what can I do? But then what we can do, if we don't know of that work of grace in our hearts, we can get down on our knees and we can plead that God might be merciful to us. That he might send forth his spirit into our hearts, that he would effect that change, that radical change uh, that we need in order that we might know and serve Jesus Christ from the heart. And then let's not be too proud. Let's not stand aloof and say, well, if God's going to save me, he'll save me. Uh, let us get down on our knees and beg that he might be pleased to give us the light and life that comes through Jesus Christ. You know what the scripture says? If we will do that, if we'll do that with sincerity, then he will not cast us out. He'll do. He'll do exactly what we see. Notice the radical and life-changing effect upon Saul here in our text. Verse 6, he says, Lord, he says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Note the humility of spirit. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Surely prior to this, Saul was actually only interested in doing his own will. And now he inquires as to what the will of the Saviour is for him. Shortly prior to this, he had been acting under a commission from the Sanhedrin. And now he renounces their supreme authority and he asks what Jesus Christ would have him to do. Prior to this, Saul had been engaged in a career of opposition to the cause of Christ and now he seeks to know what Christ's will is for him. Notice the willingness and the eagerness. What will thou have me to do? We see here, here entire submission and devotion to Jesus Christ. Gone is the persecutor of the New Testament church. We see here a man who is now willing to sacrifice all for the cause of Christ. A man who would uh, say in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. A man who says in Philippians 3 verses 7 and 8, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. As we read this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, this change in uh, Saul uh, caused him to sacrifice much for the uh, cause of Christ. I read that uh, chapter again, or that verse again. It uh, speaks about how he was beaten and how he suffered the loss of many of the uh, things that one enjoys in this world in the service of Jesus Christ. 
we see here is a sudden and entire change in Saul's views. He had previously regarded Jesus Christ as a mere man. In fact, really as an evil man. A man who had been unfaithful, so Saul thought, to the religion of his fathers. A perverter of the truth. He had previously viewed Jesus Christ as an imposter. One who falsely pretended to be the long-awaited Messiah. But in the space of a moment, all that had changed. And what an extraordinary change. This man, who had been the great persecutor of the church, would actually become the great preacher of the gospel. He'd become the missionary to the Gentiles. He would become the greatest of the apostles. This man, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, would write numerous books of the New Testament scriptures. There's an interesting thing about a Saul. Saul never forgot what he did to the church of Jesus Christ. And the memory of these things always stayed with him. You read, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, where he says, For I am the least of the apostles. And he goes on to say that I'm not meet actually to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Indeed, Paul, we are told, viewed himself as the chief of sinners. In 1 Timothy 1.15, we read, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The same radical change took place in Saul can also be seen in all who are ever arrested by Jesus Christ. Those whom Jesus Christ arrests will become his servants, or as we saw this morning, his slaves. And they will give their lives into his service. That's true for all of us, whether we be young or old. We will actually give our lives into his service. In every circumstance of life, uh, he will be what is most important to us. We won't be engaged in the pursuit of uh, self-interest, self-desire, uh, when the Spirit of God has worked in our hearts. But we'll say with, the, uh, with Saul, Lord, what will thou have me to do? What will thou have me to do? Again, brethren, we need to ask ourselves, is that our life? Is that uh, what others would see in us? We say that there's been a work of God's grace in us. We make public profession of our faith even. Uh, but is the uh, life of Christ actually seen in us? But then let us remember that our salvation is all of grace. I think that helps us to understand too why when Paul, for example, in Galatians writes on this subject, these events of his own life clearly influence how he views this issue. Uh, this is a profound issue uh, for the apostle. He experienced the grace of God, perhaps in a way that it's uh, difficult for us altogether to understand. 
You know, brethren, we do have some sense of that. If we actually look at our own lives and reflect on our own lives and what our own lives uh, were without Christ, but we also have some semblance of understanding of what the Apostle uh, came to understand. Brethren, by God's grace, uh, let us be those uh, who seek uh, to live uh, as the children of God. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief word of prayer. Uh, Lord, our prayer, our, our sincere desire is that you might be pleased to work in the hearts of each and every one here this evening. Lord, what more could we desire for those whom we know and love, but that they might know Jesus Christ, that there might be a genuine work of grace in their hearts. Now let us therefore pray uh, for those that we know and love who perhaps at this point in time uh, don't come and don't make uh, and don't profess faith in Christ. But let us never cease uh, to pray for them. For thou art a gracious God and salvation is in fact all of grace. It's not of ourselves. It's not because we are a a good man or a good woman or because we have some, uh, as it were, bank of uh, good works uh, that we can lean upon. All, all of that is trite. There's nothing whatsoever to do uh, with salvation. Salvation is all of grace. And so our prayer, Lord, is that we might uh, seek thee, that we might look to thee, we might long that you would come and work in our hearts. As we said in the course of the sermon, let us not be too proud, Lord, uh, to get down on our knees and to seek thee and to plead that you might be merciful to us. This we pray for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.